You had to add that in? Everybody for taking. <coughs> that was actually a very nice introduction. Nice than the one I gave myself. Several years ago, I was asked uh, by the National Archives to do double duty writing a presidential library at the time in Iowa and um, taking on the Eisenhower Seminary out in Abilene, Kansas. I guess I should say the other Abilene. Um, and I remember the first time I was introduced to a group about this size, and I uh, defined myself as someone who'd been a presidential freak since he was about six years old. And the next day's paper ran the headline, Freak to Run Eisenhower Centenary. <laughs> True story. Of course, it was the day before the internet and streaming. We won't talk about my high book. Um, and you thought of running for the Virginia Assembly. Um, anyway, in return for your hospitality, this evening I promise to keep in mind some cautionary words of Abraham Lincoln, who said of a long-winded Springfield lawyer that he could compress the most words into the smallest ideas of anyone he knew. The great prairie novelist Willa Cather wrote that the history of every country begins in the heart of a man or woman. This is not a view widely held in the modern classroom, where heroes and villains, for that matter, are out of fashion. And narrative storytelling is often crowded out by statistical analysis. But of course it wasn't a statistic that wrote the Gettysburg Address, or charged up San Juan Hill, or challenged Mikhail Gorbachev to tear down this wall. Individuals matter. If you doubt that, imagine our history without Washington on the balcony of Federal Hall, Lincoln proclaiming emancipation, or Woodrow Wilson crusading for his League of Nations. Visualize the 20th century without John F. Kennedy going to the brink over Soviet missiles in Cuba, or the 21st without George W. Bush, bullhorn in hand, standing atop the smoking ruins of the World Trade Center. And if individuals matter, then individual leaders matter greatly. You need hardly uh, hear from me. Ari will give us a much, much greater insight into the uh, quadrennial frenzy on which we are all embarked called choosing a president. What tests should voters apply in that process? What criteria should they be guided by? The Constitution, after all, says very little about a president's qualifications. The only legal qualifications it spells out require that one must be 35 years or older, native born, and a resident within the United States for at least 14 years. That's it. Nowhere does our organic charter mention educational background, communication skills, administrative or legislative experience. Nor does it mention personal traits like judgment, compassion, conscience, or that all-purpose resume buster works well with others. <laughs> These and a host of other factors as well are left to you, the electorate, to weigh along with your ideological and policy preferences. So does history have anything to contribute as you ponder your decision? We historians, after all, like to think of ourselves as being in the perspective business. On the other hand, of course, we're often criticized for loving the past so much we live in it. When you stop to think the alternative is Charlie Sheen, TMZ, and anyone named Kardashian, <laughs> that the past is really not such a bad place to live. <laughs> For a few minutes, with your permission, I'd like to step back a bit and offer a decidedly non-partisan alternative to the 60-second spots, focus group sound bites, and fourth race journalism that passes for the making of the president 2012. If it's any consolation, negative campaigning's been around since the earliest days of the Republic, so has media bias. Consider the charge was leveled by one Connecticut newspaper at Thomas Jefferson in 1800. Should the then Vice President of the United States defeat the incumbent John Adams, it warned, quote, 
murder, robbery, rape, adultery, and incest will all be openly taught and practiced. <laughs> the air will be rent with the cries of the distressed, the soil will be soaked with blood, and the nation black with crimes. In recent years, there's been a heated debate among presidents, politicians, and pundits alike. Does character count? You bet it does. Never more so than when a president is committing young Americans to battle. But how then do we define character? Character said Lincoln is like a tree and reputation like its shadow. The shadow is what we think of it, the tree is the real thing. But consider the tree of conviction. It goes without saying we want our presidents to be men and women of principle. What happens, however, when principles come into conflict with one another? Thomas Jefferson worshiped before the altar of strict constructionism, if no other. Yet history reveres him for putting aside his deepest convictions about limited government when Louisiana came on the market. More precisely, Jefferson's constitutional principles took a backseat to his continental vision of the United States. And most people, presumably especially those west of the Mississippi, think it's a good thing they did. We are routinely told that America's presidents are the most powerful men in the world. In truth, they're often at the mercy of unforeseen events and movements that test their deepest convictions. Richard Nixon was a principled anti-communist, at least until he walked into the 21st century and saw that it was in America's interest to bring China out of its self-imposed isolation. Lyndon Johnson, the first Southern president in 100 years, staked his presidency on principles of racial justice and economic opportunity. He lost his presidency on a principle he may or may not have believed, that America should pursue military victory in Southeast Asia, whatever the cost. One man's idea was to another's ideologue. No president was more principled than Herbert Hoover. Before his election in 1928, Hoover's name was synonymous with American generosity. He was the great humanitarian, the self-made millionaire engineer with offices on four continents living in London who abandoned his career and his fortune to organize the first great international relief effort in World War I. Uh, he would spend 50 years of his life feeding over a billion people in 56 different countries. Why is it that that's not what we remember Hoover for? Rather, the Great Depression. If you go to Russia today, or Belgium, or Czechoslovakia, you'll meet Hoover the hero. Hoover the symbol of American compassion, decency, and generosity. In his own land, he's a symbol of the Great Depression. There's a reason for that. He stuck to his principles. The same volunteerism that he believed in, that fed Belgium in World War I, that observed meatless Mondays and wheatless Wednesdays to save food to send to the Allies. The next time you chew sugarless gum, think of Herbert Hoover. It was uh, part of the Food Administration in World War I. The same reliance upon volunteerism from what he said were the most generous people on the face of the earth, became a ball and chain. Once he became president and confronted an international crisis greater than anyone could imagine, himself included. Overnight the rules changed. No longer was it enough for a president to be a skilled administrator or legislative strategist in times of distress, he must serve as empathizer in chief, a role for which Hoover of all men was temperamentally unsuited. He was a Quaker, orphaned at eight, who sat in a cold meeting house waiting for the inner light to come to him. He said as an old man that he was 10 years old before he realized he could do something for the sheer pleasure of it without offending the Lord. Not surprisingly, uh, he was not a particularly empathetic figure. His Quaker conscience was muffled 
by his Quaker reticence. And so the hero of World War I, the man who saved more lives than Hitler, Stalin, and Mao together, wiped out. That man rode to the final rally of his 1932 campaign through crowds of New Yorkers chanting, we want bread. A successful president combines principle with pragmatism. Harry Truman did not lack for principles. Indeed, he drew more than one line in the sand during the explosive years after World War II, when NATO, the Truman Doctrine, and the Marshall Plan were improvised, all with the help of the so-called do-nothing 80th Congress. In Korea, Mr. Truman redefined the meaning of war and victory themselves. And in firing General Douglas MacArthur, he upheld the principle of civilian rule over the military at no small cost to his short-term popularity. A successful president is as comfortable as was Mr. Truman in his own skin. He, he used to say, it would be interesting if uh, Moses had stopped in the middle of the desert to take a poll. <laughs> Calvin Coolidge doesn't seem at like first glance like Mr. Truman. Actually, they have a lot in common, including their very uh, healthy attitude toward the temporary stewardship of any president. Coolidge said this, it is a great advantage to a president and a major source of safety to the country for him to know that he is not a great man. <laughs> I um, had the great good fortune over the years to, uh, to get to know and eventually become very close to both President and Mrs. Ford. Gerald Ford, of course, uniquely among our recent presidents, never aspired to the White House, never um, imagined himself there, and brought a lot of that Coolidge um, attitude with him. Um, and if he was ever tempted to forget where he came from, um, he had something that no constitution provides for, but which undoubtedly is more important than any constitutional provision. He had a wife, like <laughs> Betty Ford. On August 9th, 1974, the day that the president was sworn in in the East Room, they went back to their ranch house in uh, suburban Alexandria. Uh, because they wanted to give the Nixons a week, well, the Julie and other members of the family a week to pack up and move out. And that evening, Mrs. Ford was in the small kitchen slaving over a pan of lasagna. And she said, Jerry, there's something wrong with this picture. You're president of the United States, and I'm still cooking. <laughs> now, no constitution can give you that. For all their surface differences, Harry Truman, Calvin Coolidge, and Gerald Ford were all grounded. None of them required the presidency to be whole. Being grounded takes more than a sense of self or a sense of place. It requires a sense of self, and it often expresses itself in a sense of humor, which is nothing more than a synonym for a sense of proportion. Success in the presidency requires a backbone, to be sure. Mr. Truman thought it called for a funny bone as well. A man without a sense of humor, he said, would go mad in the Oval Office. For a politician, humor is both weapon and shield. It is a safety valve, a sure sign of mental health, and the best antidote for that preening self-importance known as Potomac fever. Grover Cleveland had few friends on Capitol Hill, particularly in the talkative guild that calls itself the world's greatest deliberative body. It is said that one night Cleveland was rudely awakened by his wife, who whispered that there were thieves in the house. No, my dear, he replied, thieves in the Senate, not in the house. <laughs> No friend of the establishment press one day revealed that the family spaniel Millie had given birth to puppies, which were at that very moment lying on top of the New York Times and Washington Post. 
According to Bush, it was the first time in history that those newspapers had been used to stop leaks. <laughs> Humberton disarm as well as deflate. The oldest of our presidents, Ronald Reagan, delivered more age jokes than anyone since Jack Betty. To those critical of his administrative style, Reagan observed that the right hand of his administration didn't know what its far right hand was up to. <laughs> he loved to tell Gorbachev jokes. And I'll never forget. But the amazing thing is he told them to Gorbachev, which is <laughs> remarkable when you stop to think about it. I'll never forget what I heard on a number of occasions it involved a long, predictable line outside the Kremlin of uh, long-suffering Soviet citizens uh, waiting for an opportunity to, to go into the store and buy whatever consumer goods were available. And uh, there wasn't much, and the line wasn't moving very fast, and frustration was building. And finally, someone near the end of the line said, I can't take this anymore. It's Gorbachev's fault. I'm going to go shoot Gorbachev. And he broke away from the line, ran across Red Square, and disappeared over the horizon. 24 hours later, the line has barely moved. Um, and someone says, hey, here's the guy who's going to shoot Gorbachev. And as he approaches him, everyone in the line says, well, did you shoot Gorbachev? And he said, that line was twice as long. <laughs> It's a terrible thing, said Franklin Roosevelt, to look over your shoulder when you're trying to lead and find no one there. FDR illustrates another facet of successful presidential leadership. To inspire confidence in others, you must have confidence in yourself. No one embodied this more than Roosevelt, the polio victim who refused to be victimized. As a result, in the economically bleak 1930s, it was said of FDR, that it took a man on crutches to teach a crippled nation how to walk. He was hardly alone in facing and overcoming adversity. His cousin Theodore lost both his wife and his mother on the same terrible day, Valentine's Day, 1887. Lincoln struggled with poverty, death, and rejection at the polls. Even Ronald Reagan, famed for his sunny disposition, grew up the son of an alcoholic in a series of houses and apartments that were rarely lived in long enough to be called home. Like Roosevelt before him, of course, President Reagan brilliantly used the mass media of his day to raise the nation's mood through the force of his personality and unquenchable optimism. It must be said, however, that he had a good deal more help in this regard than FDR. By the 1980s, the bully pulpit had been institutionalized to include three people in the White House Office of Communication, ten more in the Office of Speech Writing and Research, two in the Office of Media Relations and Planning, fourteen in the Office of Public Liaison, three in the Office of Public Affairs, two in the Office of Communication and Planning, fourteen in the Office of the Press Secretary, and five in the Office of News Summary and Audio Service. Under the circumstances, the White House became a temple in the cult of presidential personality. Today it stands ringed with satellite dishes, ready to beam every presidential utterance to a public that may or may not be eager to listen. Indeed, the single greatest threat posed to the modern presidency may well be overexposure. After all, how many television characters last more than a single season, let alone four or eight years? If that is exactly what presidents have become, in this 24-7 news cycle, guests in our home and just about as likely to wear out their welcome. So what about 2012? If history is any guide, we ought to be looking for a principled pragmatist with a firm grip on the national interest and the confidence that comes from having been tested. He or she should be able to laugh at oneself and at the absurdities and inflated egos of public life. Like Jefferson and Truman, the next president should be adaptable. If not a visionary per se, he should have vision. In TR's robust formula, he should keep his feet on the ground and his eyes on the stars. He ought to like and care about his fellow humans far more than the trappings of office. We can all breathe easier if a president knows who he is, where he comes from, 
and to where inevitably he will one day return. A president's conscience should be at least as acute as his reading of the polls. Ideally, he will pay attention to history without ever tailoring his actions to the fickle electorates of academics who comprise the ultimate electorate. Great presidents spend themselves in causes greater than themselves for purposes nobler than re-election. They live up to Lincoln's wartime dictum. The occasion is piled high with difficulty and we must rise with the occasion. Most of all, this paragon of leadership should be a gifted politician, able to manipulate men and events while disguising his mastery. For the presidency is first, foremost, and always a political job. Every face on Mount Rushmore is that of a political genius, and that includes George Washington, whose particular genius was to convince everyone, beginning with himself, that he was no politician at all. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln was a man, as a young man, defined by conventional political ambition. He wanted status. He wanted to escape his humble origins. He wanted to be accorded a success. The greatness of Lincoln, it seems to me, lies in his capacity over time to outgrow purely personal ambition, even more to outgrow the conventions of the racist society that produced him. Over time, his ambition was purified through his growing involvement with the anti-slavery movement. Logic told him it was hypocritical for a nation that professed its love of liberty to keep millions of human beings in chains. Another kind of logic, the compelling logic of the battlefield, would in time bring him to the round, around to the view that a war over states' rights must ultimately be fought and justified over human rights. In the process, and if he remains the president against whom all others are measured, which I think he is, it's because his presidency demonstrated as no other the essential truth of leadership in a democracy, that there can be no authority without moral authority. Washington possessed it as if by divine right. Jefferson earned it through his pen, Jackson with his sword, T.R. because he was born to pound a pulpit. Victory at the polls can reinforce it, but it can hardly create it. When at some future date, the high court of history sits in judgment on each of us, said John F. Kennedy, our success or failure in whatever office we may hold will be measured by the answers to four questions. Were we truly men of courage were we truly men of judgment? Were we truly men of integrity? Were we truly men of dedication? 50 years on, we can modify Kennedy's formula to read men and women. For America's first female president is an inevitable part of our unwritten history. In any event, we might all remember those days on election day. So ideally, might whomever we elect president. Thank you very much.